Can I let you guys in on a little secret? The left does not want the separation of church and state. It doesn't matter how much they talk about it, how much they ring that bell every time somebody prays in the Senate or Congress or, or in the schoolhouse. The left is interested in one thing. They're interested in a church that is subservient to the state. They want a church that bows down to the state. They want a church that worships the state. They want a church that willingly complies with whatever the state says, without rebuttal and without argument. The left wants a church that's weak and that it can control and that it can use whenever it needs to, to promote its agenda. And I believe that they have found that church. Progressive Christianity, or what I call the Christian left. My name is Lucas Miles. I'm the author of a book called The Christian Left, How Liberal Thought Has Hijacked the Church. We got some in the back afterwards. And I'm the guy that's been blowing the whistle on the Christian left. And you can clap for that. To be honest, after I wrote my book, I turned it in to a bunch of uh, uh, my peers that I really respect. I gave it to three or four people, and every single one of them came back and said, Lucas, you're missing a chapter. And I said, I hate it when that happens. <laughs> I thought I was done. I thought I'd birthed the whole thing. And they said, you're not done. There's a chapter that's missing. You got to name names. And I didn't want to do it. I'll be honest. I didn't want to do it. I knew who they were. It wasn't a secret. I just didn't want to. I didn't want to make waves like that. I just wanted to stay in doctrine and theology. But I went back to the Word of God, and I started seeing Paul make statements like, look out for Alexander the metal worker. <laughs> so I wrote down Beth Moore, you know, and these different names that are out there. Oh, did I offend somebody? I'm sorry. I'm from South Bend, Indiana. We got any Notre Dame fans out there? You know that school with the football team that's Catholic in name only? Yeah, that one. And I'll tell you, living in South Bend is where I really started becoming aware of the rise of progressive Christianity. And there was this guy named Mayor Pete Buttigieg. <laughs> and look, I, I don't expect people of the world, people who aren't believers, to have a Christian morality. I think that's actually something that's very um, dangerous for Christians to try to project a Christ morality on unbelievers before they know Christ. It's what makes us come across as bigots. But Pete was different. And as I started seeing him in 2012, 2013, 2014, I started just putting two and two together. And I started going around on the record saying, this guy's going to run for president. I was laughed at. I was laughed at. And I said, look, he's going to be a contender. He's going to be the guy. And I'm, I'm still telling you, he's going to be the guy. He has been propped up. Mark Zuckerberg came to South Bend, one of his uh, uh, Harvard buddies, do secret meetings with him. And Pete, the reason I bring him up is not because I hate Pete. I actually know Pete a little bit. He probably wouldn't claim that he knows me. But I think he's a poster child for the Christian left. He's a prototype. And we could talk about why. I saw James Lindsay walk in, James, love your stuff, and, and obviously, you know, you've, you've done a lot of work on, on showing how Pete's father, a Marxist Notre Dame professor, was the lead translator on Gramsci Italian communist work. We could talk about how uh, all these different things with Pete, but the thing that I saw more than anything else was this guy was going on the campaign trail during his mayor uh, uh, candidacy, as well as his candidacy for the Democratic candidate for president, and he was doing exegesis of biblical passages. He was breaking them down, not just talking about God, not just saying, you know, thank God or praise Jesus or these things that we hear candidates say. He was actually breaking down passages to show how the scriptures supported transgenderism, uh, LGBT agenda, pro-choice, open borders. And I thought, that's dangerous. I woke up that day. You know, since that time, what has really stood out to me is that there is this rising, what I call, 
um, constituency, this Christian left that is embracing leftist ideology, Marxism, critical race theory, critical theory, liberal views of, of gender, sexuality, marriage. And it doesn't just exist outside of the church. It's found its way inside. I believe what has happened is that the Christian left has essentially exchanged the trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit for the trinity of diversity, acceptance, and social justice. See, in the last two years, we've seen members of the Christian left embrace CRT, condemn a pro-life Supreme Court justice, willingly bow to government tyranny in the form of forced church closures, closures and vaccine mandates, and my favorite, I saw a Christian pastor who was openly gay promote the idea on TikTok that Jesus was gender fluid and had a homosexual relationship with John, his disciple, because he, because he called him my beloved. All of this lines up with a Pew Forum study that came out this year that now 24% is all that is left of the church that holds to the view that Scripture is authoritative, inerrant, and infallible. That means that over three-fourths of the church has let go of the Bible as the source of objective truth. See, I believe that this is in large part due to a systematic move within the Christian left to academically downgrade the Bible to merely the story of God. If you're a history buff, this comes from the quest for the historical Jesus, and it's been about a hundred and some years in the making. They've downgraded the Bible to a narrative. They look at the big picture. We talk about the story, but we don't talk about the word. All this promotes a doctrine of universalism and inclusion. Now, let me be clear. Denying God's word is no different than denying Christ himself. Anybody agree with that out there? Yeah. See, the Christian left, though they themselves, they hold themselves to be too enlightened to rely on the Bible as their ultimate guide to truth. This heretical form of doctrinal drift rooted in Gnostic thought relies heavily on reason and logic to establish truth and places human reasoning on a self-made pedestal above the Bible regarding issues of doctrine, morality, and justice. The question is, why have so many of our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, Christian authors, recording artists, Christian media personalities, why have they made this slide over into the heretical dark waters of progressive Christianity? See, I believe that progressivism, it's attractive to formerly biblically-minded Christians, especially after they have some sort of moral failing, because it offers a halfway house that allows them to remain largely religious and socially responsible, but relieves them from the responsibility of holding to what they consider these antiquated biblical teachings, such as miracles, the authority of scripture, sexual holiness, or the sinfulness of humanity. So you're never going to hear Mayor Pete talk about heaven and hell. You're never going to hear Mayor Pete talk about repentance. You're never going to hear the Christian left talk about the depravity of man. Why? Because it does not fit their agenda. See, I want to bring this up here because essentially what the Christian left has done is it's, it's humanized Christ and boiled down the teachings of Jesus to simply feed the hungry, clothe the poor, and accept people who are different than you, which of course we should do. But we do those because they are spiritual and not because they are essentially humanistic. See, there's a term that's used by the mainstream media, and I don't know if anybody else is going to talk about this this weekend, but it's Christian nationalism. And I'm sure there are those that would love to label this conference and probably already have labeled this conference a Christian nationalist event at Liberty University. <laughs> now let's talk about Christian nationalism for a second. I saw my friend Eric Metaxas earlier. He, he wrote about a, a group called the German Nazified Church in his book Bonhoeffer. 
And when you think of the word nationalist, everybody thinks of the word Nazi. It's actually a dog whistle to try to essentially relate or correlate evangelical Bible-believing Christians with the Nazi party. Who were the German Nazified church? They were a church that rejected biblical orthodoxy in order to embrace the doctrines of the Third Reich, and they would do whatever they could to support those doctrines using Jesus and the church as propaganda to do so. It is exactly the playbook that the Christian left is following today. Don't ever let anybody call you a Christian nationalist because you love the Lord and you love this country. That's just called being a good Christian. Amen? See, there's, there's essentially this thing that the Christian left talks about all the time, and it's inclusion. We have to be very inclusive as Christians. To not be inclusive means that you're not loving. See, I believe that there's a great misunderstanding about the gospel. See, the gospel is 100% the most inclusive message on the planet and 100% the most exclusive message on the planet. Like most, most truths, truth is in the paradox. And see, the inclusivity of the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for the sins of the entire world. And the exclusivity of the gospel is only by grace through faith that you have to put your faith in him in order to be able to receive the benefits of the gospel, the benefits of the cross, and to be able to be called a child of God. Membership and belonging are never a given. Faith is always required to get you in, and not just any faith, but specifically a faith that believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection proved his exclusive identity and granted us divine redemption. This is troublesome, though, for the left. They have to debunk these verses, revise church history, and silence any opposition in order to protect the self-gratification of their itching ear theology. The Bible says that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. See, if you want to understand what real love looks like, see, the left doesn't understand love. They think love is acceptance. If you don't agree with me, then you don't love me. The Bible says that love is rooted in grace and truth. And those two things have to go hand in hand. If you elevate an idea of grace over truth, you become a progressive. If you elevate truth over grace, you become a bigot. You become a Pharisee. And see, the reality is we have to operate in grace and truth if we are going to win back the church and ultimately win back the country. See, I believe that there's a cycle that most Christians have fallen into because we're so frustrated with the stories and the, and the, the headlines and the, seeing our friends and loved ones drift away. We fall into a pattern of what I call worry, anger, apathy. We worry about our loved ones, and so we, you, you know, we fall into manipulation and guilt and trying to pull them back, and when that doesn't work, we get mad at them. We see Twitter wars and fights at the Thanksgiving dinner table. When that doesn't work, we throw our hands up in the air and we say, this will never work. I'm done. And then we have what we have in the church in America today, one of the most apathetic organizations and I'm going to use the word organization because it's, it's, it's in many cases just a shadow of the bride of Christ. Around. We have to break out of that. Paul says the way that we do it in 2 Corinthians 5 is that it's the love of Christ that compels us. It's God's love that motivates us and moves us. The worst they can do is kill you guys. And as a Christian, that ain't so bad. I mean, you read these accounts of the first century church, they're like, I mean, you got this guy Ignatius, and he like willingly is willing to go in, and he's like, I hope the lions chomp on me for the glory of God. And we're afraid somebody's going to say something bad about us on Twitter. The first case that Solomon, when he became king, had to judge between was two women that came to him, both claiming that a living child was their own, and that the dead baby that was before them was the opposite woman's. And Solomon didn't have DNA testing. He had no way to prove it. And as he thought about it for a second, God gave him an idea. 
in order to try to figure out who the true mother was of this child, he said, bring a sword and cut the baby in half. The real mother screamed and said, no, let them have it. Let her have it. And he said, give the baby to the woman who was willing to give it up. See, I believe that what we see, if you want to know the difference between what's true and what's false, look at who is willing to cut the baby in half. Who's willing to let it go? And by that, I mean the Word of God. Who is willing to slice up the Word of God in order to, uh, you know, create um, justification for their belief system? And who is willing to hold on to it in its completeness, even in the parts that are hard for us and even in the parts that rebuke my own theology? We have to break free of worry, anger, and apathy. And we have to learn how to speak the truth in love and tether ourselves to the Word of God. I pray we can. Thank you.